Good morning, Thank Professor you. Sanjay Deshmukh, sir, Honorable former Vice Chancellor, University of Mumbai, and today's Thank esteemed you. keynote speaker, uh, Shri Mahabubul Hak, sir, Honorable Chancellor, University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya. Participants of the program, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya, we would like to welcome all to the fourth lecture of the USTM webinar lecture series, organized to discuss the various aspects issues and challenges in higher education during and post COVID-19, and especially the role of universities in research development and innovation. Uh, before we begin, I would like to request all the participants to kindly mute their audio systems and microphones. Um, during the session, participants can post their queries in the chat box and the question answer box. Uh, also, uh, selected queries will be taken up for uh, question answers, seeing the, like, taking into account the time factor. We'd also request all the participants to kindly fill the feedback form. The link of the feedback form will be shared uh, during this session at the end of this session. An e-certificate will be issued to the participants who had submitted the feedback forms only. Our feedback forms are to be submitted by uh, tonight, uh, like midnight tonight. Uh, I would now like to request uh, Dr. Alpana Chaudhary, Director of Students Affairs, USTM, to kindly present the welcome address. Alpana. Uh, good morning, one and all. I welcome Professor Sanjay Deshmukta, the Honorable former Vice Chancellor of Mumbai University, as today's esteemed speaker of the lecture series, Role of Universities in Research and Innovation During COVID-19. I welcome all the participants and my colleagues who have joined this live session. Due, due to this pandemic, there is a big challenge in front of researchers across the country. And we are sure that today's deliberation by our esteemed distinguished speaker, Professor Sanjay Deshmuksa, will give a new direction to the researchers in finding out strategies to meet these challenges. Once again, we welcome Professor Sanjay Deshmuksa to this introduction and request him to kindly start his speech. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we allow Sanjay Deshmukh sir to speak, I think there are a few things, uh, everybody knows of Sanjay Deshmukh sir, but still, I would like to uh, like, you know, so elaborate a few points. Uh, as we know, ladies and gentlemen, we have today with us our Professor Shandit Ismuk, sir, one of India's widely acknowledged life scientists and an academic thought leaders in higher education. Professor Deshmukh, sir, has served as the youngest ever vice chancellor of the 162-year-old University of Mumbai, encompassing over 800 affiliated colleges with over 8 lakh students. He has brought transparency in the system and has built a global best practices with a view on skilling and increasing employability. Uh, currently, sir, is the professor of life science at the University of Mumbai uh, with a research experience at both national and international level spanning over 50 countries. Sir is the only faculty of the university who is recognized as a PhD guide in five subjects. He is associated with many organizations of national and international repute, including USTM. He is our mentor, he is our guide, and he is provide, providing us strong strategic leadership in global environment and development issues. Uh, we are indeed honored, sir, that you have uh, like, given your consent to uh, address today's uh, lecture series. So the session is yours now. Thank you very much, Mahizabin, madam. I also would like to thank Alpana, madam, for the kind initiation of this particular theme as well as the event. At the outset, I would like to express my gratitude and thanks to the Honorable Chancellor, Dr. Mahabubul Haq, for his kindness in including me as a part of this oration series, which I'm sure, sure is going to be one of the very exciting events of this university. And it will reach not only within India, but abroad, where people would be watching this with much interest. I am also honored to follow on the earlier speakers who have been very, very eminent and visionary leaders, not only in the academia, but also in their own life. And fortunately, I know some of the speakers of this event and the earlier speakers have been Professor Ved Prakash, the former chairman of UGC, as well as the former chairman of UPSC, Dr. Agrawal, and the former chairman of AICT, Professor Mantha. They have given a fantastic start to this oration series. And now the responsibility lies on me to ensure that the justification of my inclusion in the list 
is properly made thank you very much everybody i would also like to acknowledge the kind presence of honorable vice chancellor of usstm honorable pro vice chancellor honorable registrar honorable deans of various faculty honorable faculty members both teaching and non teaching as well as very dynamic students of usstm whom i have interacted a few times besides those all the important dignitaries and the visitors as well as the viewers of this important event i would like to welcome them and thank you very much for their presence as all of us know that uh, the topic of my lecture which has been already uh, already announced and uh, we have been able to see the title which uh, basically deals with role of universities in research development and innovation just for a second i would like to check with the organizers whether they are able to see the presentation absolutely sir absolutely okay. thank you very much yes. this particular theme has been discussed time and again and particularly in the 21st century when we are talking about education to the masses the main problem comes with respect to the economy of the world as all of us know there are various critical issues that concern the globe as an ecosystem and we the human beings are only a part of it if you look at the total biological resources on the planet they amount to almost 1.8 million species and we as human beings are only one of them however the number and the multitude and the magnitude at which we are multiplying and we have reached almost 7th billion mark a couple of years ago the majority of the human species on this planet are not even having sharing of equitable resources they do not have access to the basic requirements which i believe is their fundamental right and therefore when we are talking about education particularly in a country which constitutes one sixth of the world's population and also is regarded as one of the key players in the 21st century by sheer presence of its almost 65% population which is below 35 years of age as well as a country which has got capacity and a tradition a history of over 10000 years which is a documented history of knowledge and wisdom which has given leadership to the entire world in the area of education and therefore from the time that we got our independence in 1947 until the time we had the premier institute concerning the higher education in the country known as universities grants commission which was established as early as in 1956 till then we had only 60 universities operating within the country and within 1956 till today in less than 70 years the total number of universities in india both private and state level universities has crossed 1000 mark in addition to that if you look at the affiliated colleges and independent institutions which are either in research or academics the total number of them is crossing almost 49000 however when we are looking at the percentage of young generation with respect to undergraduates who aspire and who are capable as well as eligible to go for higher education they are not in a position to go for higher education particularly at the post graduate level and hardly 7.2% of our undergraduates get an opportunity to go for post graduate studies the major problem or major limiting factor of this particular situation is the economic disparity and the parents of these children who are more than 93.8% of the total population of undergraduates in our country they are not in a position to support the education of their children and that is the only reason that in our country we have a tremendous issues with regard to providing education to the masses to the eligible and able young generation of our country in today's context when we look at role of universities in research development and innovation i personally look at it from the point of view of a biologist and ecologist by training and then as a teacher of postgraduate level education 
and of course as an administrator and a policy maker to the extent that i have had the great opportunity to lead one of the premier institutions of our country one of the oldest universities in our country the university of mumbai about which a brief mention was made by mahzabin madam you can imagine the dynamics of an institution where we are to control a staff at administration level close to 3000 and about 30000 teachers are teaching in the main campus as well as the affiliated colleges of university with these dynamics when you look at the higher education scenario and the level at which we are talking about bringing in standards bringing in competency as well as bringing in transparency in dissemination of knowledge at, at higher education there are enormous number of limitations and therefore the presentation that i am going to make and the oration the topic of which is role of universities in research development and innovation there is a lot that has been happening in our country and throughout the world there is always an outflow of young generation after completion of their undergraduate studies and they always aspire to go abroad for higher education however in the advent of covid 19 scenario the pandemic which, which has shaken the entire world both at economic level and as well as at, at environmental level we'll have to redesign and redefine our entire gamut of education system particularly at higher education level the government of india is taking enormous steps and a very cautious approach with regard to providing higher education in the current situation as well as the post covid situation in years to come however the changes that have been brought about due to this pandemics the approach of this presentation that i am going to make today is going to be slightly different than what i would have made about 4 months ago and therefore i had to really look at various aspects of environmental social economic ecological as well as technological to overcome the problems of what the education is going to be in the post covid 19 scenario as well as during this period how are we going to tackle the education and how are we going to project those numbers as well as perceptions to our young generation who are aspiring for making a mark in society by way of gaining wisdom through higher education as well as standing on their own feet that is what is the purpose of basic education is with this uh, brief introduction i also want to mention that the presentation that you are going to see besides my supporting statements it is going to be a varied kind of presentation which will involve a role of an ecologist looking at the scenario of research and development as well as innovation a role of an educationist a role of a teacher a role of a policy maker as well as a role as a institutional leader or a head of university like mumbai university who is looking at this scenario from different perspectives so i'm not talking about wearing different hats but the experiences that i have had throughout my life i would like to base my presentation on these facts if you are talking about the role of universities as early as five decades ago or in the year 1966 when we were talking about education policy of our country and allotment of funds from our annual budget because we used to have five year plans and under five year plans they used to be allocation of budget for various activities and the kothari commission provided an impetus for providing a separate budget for education particularly higher education and the universities grants commission was one of the main bodies or authorities which was going to regulate these decisions of the government and therefore 50 years before today if we were talking about the role of universities it was defined in three words that is creation preservation and disseminating knowledge the creation by way of defining it 50 years before today was creation of knowledge preservation was defined or applied to the concept of providing repository of knowledge and of course dissemination of knowledge was teaching and publishing and therefore the fundamental focus of all the higher education institutions was like universities they should be showing correct path for development of humanity as a whole 
however now when we are looking at 50 years down the line or 55 years down the line and we are in the year 2020 the role of universities from the point of view of the three concepts has not changed but the interpretation of these concepts has changed to a certain extent and in the pre and post covid scenario the concept of creation has now come down to research and innovation the concept of preservation has come down to academic infrastructure and i would like to mention here particularly in the last 100 years the entire structure of preservation throughout the world has not changed by way of not going away or deviating from creating infrastructure so all the institutions both at academics as, and as well as research level have developed solid infrastructure based on which their reputation their consistency in disseminating knowledge as well as their excellence has contributed to getting them into a different levels of accreditation in the global ranking and of course the dissemination of knowledge also is now looking at the perception of students on teaching and learning how do they really grasp how do they really get a chance to absorb the dissemination of knowledge at the classroom level by teachers as well as the various information and communication technologies like google or internet where they can gain the knowledge knowledge through internet and also now the recently emerging trend of online education that is also making an impact on perception and also the dissemination of knowledge at students level therefore it is said and in one of the lectures professor shivagaukar currently the vice chancellor of bennett coleman university who was also the head of delhi iit as its director he had mentioned recently and i would like to quote him who had said that university should not prepare for the future but they should actually be molding the future and therefore the perception with which we are now looking at r and d as well as innovation we will have to look at these particular scenarios coming back to the excellence or academic excellence with respect to the world of education today you look at the various lists lists which are published by various organizations looking at various criteria of evaluation of academic institutions and one of the standard figure that comes in most of these surveys that are undertaken the current list of top 100 universities in the world which was published recently highlights united states of america with highest numbers of universities within the top 100 that is 46 germany with 9 france with 8 japan south korea as well as united kingdom with 6 each china with 4 the netherlands and switzerland 3 each countries like belgium canada and singapore to each whereas denmark one i am very sorry to mention here that despite the fact that we have the great history of knowledge dissemination and we are considered as one of the oldest nations who started educating people the first university in the world was established in india we are not in a position now to come to that level of getting into the list of top 100 not only at the world level but also at the Asian level. However, there is a reprieve that we have one university or rather conglomeration of universities under the banner of IIT because IIT has got 23 different locations and each of the IITs are considered now as universities. However, the ranking of the university which was made recently, they could not segregate the data published or provided by each of these IITs and therefore they have considered IIT as a conglomeration of universities as one institution and that is how it figures in the Asian ranking of top 100 universities as one university from India. In this list we have China now topping the list including the three universities from Hong Kong, Japan with 19, South Korea with 19, Australia with 5, Singapore with 2, New Zealand with 1. Now we are talking about excellence by way of getting into the list but are we really satisfied with what we are talking about are we re really able to provide a kind of fundamental right to the individual or individual human being who may want to go for studies who may want to go for higher studies and he is unable to go for it just because he was born 
in a family where he could not get best of education, best of clothing, and even best of shelters. And therefore, if you look at the scenario as a biologist from the world biodiversity point of view, then you can understand that the 21% of the landmass that we have and the forests which are existing on this landmass support tremendous amount of biological diversity. They actually provide 60 or rather 86% of green jobs to the entire world community. And also from those who are living under the extremely poor conditions of livelihood, over 90% of them, they are directly dependent on forests for their livelihood security. We are talking about economics of forests, understanding the value of forests in national economy. And in a global context, if you look at the role of forest in the national economy, then about 75% of the per capita income through GDP, forests has 75% of the contribution. 92% of the contribution of forest is in the form of employment generation. And subsequently, if you look at exports and forex, we have 59% contribution of forests. 31% contribution in government revenues and in terms of foreign investments, we have 46% of the contribution of forests. Therefore, if you are looking at the scenario from the biological point of view and the economical point of view, then it will, it will be also necessary to look at the concentration of human beings, which is really concentrated within the 60 kilometer belt from the coastal regions. And this particular map of the world in two dimensional manner. If you can look at this, the biodiversity of the world is really confined to only 25 degrees north and 25 degrees south Celsius latitude, which is also called as the tropical belt of the planet. However, the resources rich regions of the world are also unfortunately economically very poor. And it can be seen from the statement made here that almost 76% of the world's poor are also staying in the tropical belt of the planet. The red spots that are seen here on this particular map, these are concentrations of biological resources, which are also called biological hotspots or biodiversity hotspots. Late scientist, Dr. Norman Myers, who was an advocate of environmental conservation and who brought in the concept of environmental refugees, which are basically the outcome of economic disparity throughout the world. He had mentioned this particular scenario that 44% of all species of vascular plants, 29 species of percent species of birds, 27% of endemic mammals, 38% of endemic reptiles, and 53% of endemic amphibians are basically seen in these red spots. Or these are the biological diversity where such a large percent of endemic species of various forms is observed. And so when we are talking about the longevity of human beings, the survival of human species, and the way the multiplication of numbers with which we are growing, it is estimated that every 10th year, we are going to add 1 billion population to our planet. And whether we are going to sustain this pressure of population, which is again concentrated within the 60 kilometer belts, belt, from the coastal regions of the world. In terms of production of food grains, in terms, in terms of utilization of natural resources, and also in terms of equitable sharing of resources so that you can leave something for the future, leave something for the next generation, leave something for the posterity, is going to the main priority of the planet. When we're talking about knowledge society in today's world, then the knowledge economy and society depends on its growth on the combination and a combination of four different factors which I have highlighted in this slide, which are conceiving knowledge, production of knowledge, transmission, transmission or dissemination of knowledge and use of knowledge in technological innovation. Therefore, in today's context, when we look at the education systems, particularly universities, it is understood and it is imperative that they play an important role in all these four areas. When we look at conservation from the perspective of knowledge generation, knowledge dissemination, as well as knowledge utilization, then the five points on which 
the knowledge will have to be applicable and implemented for achieving conservation which will give sustenance to the entire planet and also sustenance to the human beings as one of the 1.8 million species on this planet and that is the only way we can contribute to arresting the loss of biological diversity as well as making planet available for all the species to survive in posterity the five points which i have mentioned here are innovative use of technology which is a mix of communication tools providing local specific demand driven dynamic information in the vernacular language because locally if the people don't understand the language of science the achievement of conservation in terms of preservation and utilization cannot be done linking science with society here the linkage is between the experts with rural communities the role of local people in conservation of biological diversity comes into picture the fourth point is addressing livelihood security issues in a participatory science communication method that is lab to lab lab to land land to lab and land to land when the green revolution took place in india and in the eastern part of the world thanks to the political will of our then agriculture minister late shri c subramanyam the financial will by one of the most eminent bureaucrats shri bhutalingam and the scientific will which was led by none other than dr m s swaminathan who is also called as father of green revolution the livelihood security issues came in at a time when we had produced enough within the four years of green revolution period for india and in those four years between 1965 and 69 we had produced more than 4000 times of grains which was produced by india in the preceding 4000 years and therefore when we are looking at prerequisites of conservation we will also have to look at capacity building of rural communities and also identifying and providing or applying value to the informal innovations that these communities are practicing for ages with regard to conservation and sustainable utilization of biological diversity the five points which i had reiterated that there is some research needs to be done the research conducted by my colleagues and myself right from the beginning when i started my research about three decades ago and then started my career at ms swaminathan research foundation some of the initiative that we took they were in the form of what we call as anticipatory research and the points on which i have given highlights in five different aspects the first aspect is innovative use of technology the technological innovation by way of satellite imageries and interpretation of satellite images for various spreading an early warning for various natural calamities like cyclones or heavy rains or even to the extent of tsunami where the coastal communities if trained in interpretation of this innovative technology like satellite imageries then it is possible for us to provide an early warning to the communities which are dependent on natural resources like sea for their entire livelihood the second point is available knowledge if we can convert into the local format that is the local language or vernacular language with the help of modern tools the tools of information and communication technology and the tools like handheld or mobile phones that we talk about in utilization for every little purpose in day to day life there is if you can help us in not only identifying ourselves in the oceans with respect to our geographical position but also not crossing the of exclusive economic zones when we go for fishing at the same time for the local farmers the interpretation of information with regard to the problem that they face in their agricultural crops can be disseminated through mobile and through video conferencing experts can provide opinions as well as solutions to these farmers online by setting up a particular time frame and the people can be utilizing this knowledge for overcoming the immediate problems that they face on day to day basis linking with science with society is another aspect that i had mentioned and the photographs mentioned here are the research that was conducted by us at the ms swaminathan research foundation whereby the agricultural scenario as all of us see the india 
India's population is directly or indirectly dependent on agriculture for their livelihoods. But it is also a fact that about 70% of women are involved in all the agricultural practices that are carried out, including the crossing of uh, particular parental lines in the field and planting and transplanting and so on, including harvesting. The picture shows here a mechanism by way of which the communities are practicing traditional agriculture as well as the communities know about the entire surroundings of their village and the neighboring areas and they can map the region, what we now call it as biodiversity register. And one of our great ecologists, Dr. Maro Gagir, who had floated this concept of preparation of biological diversity register with the help of local communities, was indirectly a salute to the traditional knowledge that is passed on from generations to generation and idea as to how the disaster management plan also can be developed with the help of diversity registers. The large scale plantation in the areas which are either degraded in the coastal regions or those which are barren at present but have potential for a forest cover like mangroves. The involvement of local communities for providing livelihood security as well as providing them as an option to conservation of the forests that they are going to regenerate and also utilization of the affiliated resources like for example the mangroves which are seen being planted by the local communities. They have been given complete right not only for their preservation after they come up but also utilization of affiliated resources like fisheries and certain associated plants and animals without harming the natural forest that is going to come up by way of their efforts in terms of mangrove forests. Last but not the least in this is capacity building and also the anticipatory research that we carried out in the advent of what we told it about global warming it is now becoming a reality. The research that we started in 1989 on identification of candidate genes from the saline tolerant plants which are called mangroves with only 97 species of true and affiliated or associate mangroves throughout the world. The genes identified from these mangroves helped in development of transgenic rice which became a salt tolerant species which is also one of the associated species of mangroves that came in handy for handing over the particular technology to the people post tsunami in eastern part of India, where in Tamil Nadu, the salt tolerant rice was planted by these communities. And it proved that the knowledge dissemination in the advent of anticipated research is also very useful in development of R&D technologies. Talking about the next phase of this presentation, there is a knowledge society and how the new expectations have emerged from knowledge societies. Alongside the fundamental mission of initial training, universities should also serve for new needs in education and training, stemming from the knowledge based economy and society. And the three points that I would like to highlight here are an increasing need for scientific and technical education, opportunities for lifelong learning, and close involvement in community life. With regard to the expectation of people from education, if you look at the scenario global in the 21st century, particularly in the last five to six years, then Europe it can be seen that almost 27% of Europe's population has crossed the age of 65 years. So their generation is now fading away. Little less number of young generation which will come up and the responsibilities. About 30 million more manpower will be required in Europe with respect to the job opportunities. And therefore, a country like India, where in 21st century, we are regarded as the youngest nation in the world, we have tremendous opportunities. If you are in a position to train our young generation, not only in the formal education, but also the informal way of educating them by encouraging and developing skills within them as well as making them ready for taking the challenges of 21st century. If you look at employability of university graduates all over the world with respect to what Indian scenario is, then the countries in Europe, if you can see, 
almost 34% of university pass outs are employed uh, in uh, various entrepreneurship organizations like researchers in europe germany employs about 26% spain 55% of university graduates industries in greece employ about 70% and 80% of university graduates are employed in turkey however in asia only 11% of the university graduates who pass out with good numbers and ranks are employed in asian entrepreneurial organizations in india despite the fact that we have a tremendous young generation force in the 21st century as well as enormous number of universities our gross enrollment ratio is 26% and therefore the situation in india is that only 2% of our graduates or post graduates are in industries in today's context and therefore how do we transform university with respect to with respect to the research and development as well as the innovation part with respect to research and development we will have to begin a change within ourselves and we will have to what we call it as break the boundaries there are enormous number of faculty different subjects in which different departments are there but within and outside these institutions like university we will have to break the boundaries that is going to be the key word of today inside as i said many schools or departments are established but we will have to ensure that they are converted into interdisciplinary centers of education and people from different disciplines will have to come together to offer not only formal degrees in education but also develop skills as well as options for core as well as optional subjects that students can opt no matter which faculty they originally belong to and therefore in addition to the inside change that we are talking about the outside departments also will have to be looking at the industries and government working together and involving the young generation who are taking formal education in universities in that man the technologies that are basically going to drive the transformation is uh, shown in this manner in this particular slide and in terms of innovations and activities in research and development which are highlighted here are in the form of technologies that will drive major economic and societal transformation and they are highlighted here which are mobile internet automation of knowledge work the internet of things cloud technology advanced robotics and on the right hand side of this particular slide you can see a bar chart which highlights the range of sized potential economic impacts of all these technologies the further slide also highlights these technologies in the form of autonomous and near autonomous vehicles new generation genomics energy storage 3d printing advanced materials advanced oil and gas exploration and recovery as well as renewable energy as some of the technologies that are going to drive major economic and societal transformations uh, of today's world in terms of transformation of power of research how do we look at it how do we really translate ground breaking knowledge in a real world impact i would like to highlight an example as models developed by industries as well as the universities to cater this particular topic or theme and therefore with regard to innovation in research and development organizations like microsoft which i am highlighting as a model they have two channels one is r and d wing research and development wing which deals with technology transfer that is experience and devising and also it deals at external level that is large number of external partners that they involve in their research and development by involving university faculty in their online r&d programs it is very important that we undertake fundamental research at university and research institution level because without which we will not be able to provide solutions for the future we are also talking about a new gamut of artificial intelligence and in this particular gamut we have to focus on vertical innovation data analysis 
work with vertical leaders to make real world impact and that is what microsoft is doing they are furthering this particular concept by helping universities to develop curriculum which is the key for their success and they are talking about how do we really prepare students for industry needs you must have heard that various organizations including microsoft they have to give you an induction training to the professionals that they highlight and train them for a period of about 3 to 6 months and that is the investment that they make in the human resources which are fresh pass outs from universities however if you are able to develop curricula at the university level itself involving industries then the problem will be minimized and the investment time and money in the human resources which is employed by these organizations can be minimized it can also be looked at developing open source and online certification opportunities while they are going for formal education in higher education institutions and this certification can help them getting equipped for working with industries as soon as they pass out from universities we will have to also inculcate which microsoft is now practicing with their own employees as well as the collaborating institutions or universities that they are encouraging computational thinking and they are collaborating with outside universities for this particular purpose the next uh, point that comes out from this model of microsoft how do we really foster culture of innovation how do we really achieve the impact of culture of innovation through r&d we'll have to build programs at the undergraduate level by developing project based learning for undergraduate students we will have to bring in various disciplines together like the universities abroad which offer education in different faculties at the undergraduate level itself which is a four year program for them but here within three years we can experiment on those lines and we will have also have to identify the constructive failure individuals that is we will have to formalize this process by bringing students from ideal environment to the point of break up when these students are given projects we should expose them to a situation where the conceptual thinking in terms of success in the research projects cannot really be achieved and they will have to face certain challenges while performing those projects as internship or as a final year project and that is when they will be encouraged in a great manner to work on crazy ideas which they have but they are not able to share because they feel they are outside the gamut of formal thinking and formal education so how do we really foster the culture of innovation we'll also also make resources available for low risk projects so that students at the undergraduate and postgraduate level can experiment and we should provide them free space and allow them to pursue their crazy ideas as i mentioned earlier and also we'll have to do a lot from top down by way of instilling values the general guidance with respect to making sure that we must have a constant dialogue of top down ideas and also make opportunities create opportunities to students by providing new ideas we will also have to bridge gaps between science and economy that is the gap between university and business by creating an independent institution if possible to focus on this particular aspect certain universities have developed innovation centers recently with the active support and participation of central government in india under the grants from rusa that is rashtriya uchchatar shiksha abhiyan and the ministry of human resources development is taking appropriate steps in ensure that ensuring that the higher education is able to reach the masses whatever we do in this regard we will have to look at developing the needs through the framework of acceptable guidelines and that is where the syllabus and the development of curricula comes into picture we are now talking about innovation the aspect of innovation and emergent emergence of new expectations alongside its fundamental mission of initial training universities must cater for new needs in education and training stemming from the knowledge based economy and society this can be achieved by evolving an increasing need for scientific and technical education creating opportunities for lifelong lifelong learning and also 
have close involvement in community life how do we really have application of your work for societal development and that is how we will have to view your innovation the definition of innovation itself can be like this which is a mechanism to overcome challenges of social environmental and economic nature how do we achieve a trinity of achieving ecological efficiency economic sustainability and social equity by way of providing solutions to the world in the 21st century we'll have to share knowledge with partners we'll have to provide importance to leaders in innovation systems and the leader should be those who will create more leaders and not followers we'll have to encourage such leaders we'll also have to cut across institutional boundaries and develop a common agenda for achieving sustainability and also innovation by way of providing r&d as inputs we'll have to also find more pathways which will be innovative for sustainable development ensuring normal societal functions and the reforms at teaching level the conventional teaching is necessary it will not fade away but the teachers who are opting for that will also will have to adopt for the new technologies that are coming in handy for the dissemination of knowledge within and away from classroom teach and therefore if you look at all these points then the role of innovate universities which can drive innovation in four different aspects are highlighted here and they are fostering entrepreneurship encouraging collaboration with private sector promoting diversity and inclusion and the fourth point is exploring the nexus of technology and society the innovation economy can be driven by the universities in a very effective manner and at a global level if you look at academic technology transfer in numbers then the numbers are just given here by way of this particular diagram and if you can look at during the last 25 years till uh, 2015 almost 1.3 trillion us dollars worth amount has been contributed uh, to us gross industrial output about 591 billion dollars have been contributed to us gross domestic product that is gdp 4.3 million jobs are supported by technology innovations generated by academia about inventions with respect to the disclosed inventions about 380000 innovations have been disclosed united states alone have provided 80000 international patents within the 20 years from 1995 to 2015 the other numbers are mentioned here with respect to innovations licensed about 70% of the innovations generated from university or academia have been licensed and also 200 plus drugs and vaccines have been discovered in the two decade period from 1995 to 2015 i want to give one more example of innovation and how effectively this can be looked at and view from the point of view of involving our own students in india for making an innovation where they will actually be able to stand on their own feet after formal education and what the university of singapore has done in the last two decades beginning 2001 onwards they have had a very systematic approach of intake of students training them at different levels exposing them to the university's ecosystem as well as sending them abroad to learn from practical experiences of various institutions at industry level as well as innovation level as well as startup level and here they have been able to effectively manage their population with respect to their intake here i just want to highlight few points where they have intake of students with uh, regard to intake from various disciplines and they prepare themselves for constructive failure it is known that in australia if you want to join armed forces then they prefer students who have undergone challenges in their lives challenges in their academic career as well as challenges with respect to dealing with society their own existence in society 
if there are failures encountered by them in this particular period then they are preferred for enrollment or for intake in the defense system of australian government and that is how the mechanism works unless you face the failures you will not be able to find solutions and everything goes smooth everything looks very rosy so the national university of singapore right from 2001 has adopted this particular approach they train the people who they take in at a entry point they develop ability within them to take risks to strengthen their own path they also encourage the social entrepreneurship and they also expose these students to research projects of innovative nature as i said from 2001 they have identified 7000 students every year from which they are selected and sent to 10 different offices of silicon valley three which are in the north america three are in europe one in israel two in china and one in indonesia in jakarta 300 promising students from these 7000 are sent to silicon valley for entrepreneurship they are also identifying about 2400 students from the same lot of 7000 students which they enroll at the entry point since the last 15 years they have been exposing them to go abroad and there is a program called university overseas program or noc program of nus which these 2400 students are exposed to which involves one year internship with a startup company which is the first shift during the day time and with an additional time in the second shift these students are encouraged to undergo techno entrepreneurship with partner university which for the national university of singapore is stanford university this model in tapping innovation potential in southeast asia is also their major focus in the coming years because they believe and it is a fact that out of 650 million population of south and southeast asia about 300 million population they have mobile phones they have gadgets which basically has a tremendous potential as all of us have seen in the advent of information and communication technology revolution and therefore in the immediate future the nus proposes to build innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems for networking with universities in south and southeast asia by mentioning the models like microsoft or national university of singapore with respect to r&d as well as innovation uh, we also like to highlight some of the threats and how do we really overcome these threats which are there for innovation in the current scenario the innovation in the universities is based on the knowledge of the faculty members who have been constantly constantly researching and also collaborating with the industry the major threat is these faculty themselves because if the universities are not in a position to encourage them to go beyond their formal teaching assignment and also opportunities to learn besides their professional inputs with the company it will be very difficult in coming years to hold these faculty members from switching over to the private companies or private sector research institutions therefore it will be very important for us to encourage them for furtherance of their education furtherance of their knowledge generation and by way of this we can ensure their longer association with the university there are certain faculty at entry level which may not have a doctoral degree with them so they can also be encouraged either on deputation or by enrolling them in a area where their collaborative research with industry can be taken up as a phd topic and by way of bringing in diversity and inclusion by providing encouragement to gender the ratio of gender in the university system we will also be able to encourage the gender ratio by way of which more and more women technocrats as well as women academician will get opportunity to excel in academia after mentioning in all the things the general scenario as well as specific examples in r&d as well as innovation i would like to highlight 
the current scenario of pandemic of covid 19 and how are we going to tackle the problems there are several questions which come to the minds of our own students who have asked a very basic question whether the ug research and academics will become redundant and whether the students will study academics online and directly move to research it's a very fine concept and very encouraging situation if you are able to study at home rather online entire syllabus that you study in the classroom of course partially you will have to attend your practicals and interaction sessions and then enroll in the university for only conducting research well my answer to that question is straight no because learning on your own beyond a particular limit is very very difficult because the deep learning what we talk about is very very necessary to be accompanied at quantum level and that can be accrued only by interaction only by actually attending the classes interacting with your own colleagues and teachers and solving the difficulties and the problems that you have in your mind they can be actually posed to your teachers and solutions can be accrued and therefore it is also a fact that students cannot be just a specialist in one area and that is where the classroom teaching is going to be very important because the core courses as well as optional courses that can be offered by universities will come in very handy for them to understand and gain wisdom out of higher education and therefore they will have to be a member of society they cannot be studying in isolation when they are in an ecosystem of higher education they will be exposed eventually as a part of their research as a member of the community and they will have to develop links while they are getting educated they will have to develop links or create links to become part of that particular ecosystem it is also important that we understand that learning at classroom level learning by interaction one to one or within the groups is very important because that learning cannot be provided by google or any internet provider or any system at remote level and therefore how do we really develop technologies to teach there are many players in today's scenario who are opting for online education many institutions are towing the line of it but it will have to be partial it cannot be complete replacement of classroom teaching that we will have to keep in mind and therefore we will have to go beyond providing formal knowledge and develop innovative technologies based on our past knowledge we boast ourselves as a nation which had the first university in the world but what happened to that knowledge whether that university continued whether the education has been passed on from generations to generations whether do we have ipr whether you can actually acknowledge and reward the informal innovations accrued from the traditional base whether we can blend traditional technology with modern technologies these are the questions which we will have to answer and therefore if you have to make future universities sustainable i am coming to the last part of my presentation if you want to make future of universities sustainable then as i mentioned and reiterated we will have to involve industries to design syllabi that would have both fundamental education and research which is a key component of university curricula we will also have to imbibe critical thinking among students and we will also strive for an attitude which till recently was in the form of inform first then influence and then inspire the young generation like your students we will have to reverse this particular trend and we'll have to inspire them initially by way of your knowledge by way of by way of interacting face to face in the classroom we'll have to influence them with your knowledge base as well as appreciating their knowledge and uh, you'll have to also look at informing them after gaining this particular confidence in the minds of young generation therefore if you want to make universities sustainable the further three points i would like to highlight is to create graduates who can cater to the needs of companies we'll have to make computational thinking which i had mentioned in one of my earlier slides such as artificial intelligence as a part of a non technical course and define curricula accordingly and last but not the least imbibe lifelong learning philosophy in higher education of acquiring knowledge upgrade and continuity evolve if you are looking at 
an agenda in the post covid scenario or i would call it agenda 21 the agenda of higher education in the field of research and development as well as innovation in the 21st century where we have already completed two decades but still we are not in a position to meet the challenges posed by united nations which we call it as a millennium development goal there are eight points and most of them are integrated very closely with respect to human species and their association with surrounding environment with surrounding ecosystems and how do we look at respecting the other biological resources and ensure that these resources are equitably shared not only with respect to the environment and the interaction but also with respect to the people who do not have access to utilization of these resources and therefore the universities will have to work in the new area uh, new area as well as new era in the post covid situation and also in the 21st century where we'll have to prepare students for a rapidly changing job market and prepare them to be the architects of the world in which we live we'll have to help students to adapt to disruptive technologies and we have nicolas negroponte who has been an advocate of developing this scheme and concept of disruptive technologies by ensuring that the new economy works for everyone and last but not the least we'll have to succeed and for succeeding we must ensure that talent from the diverse global community has access to opportunity in the new economy we have one of the great personalities dr ms swaminathan who along with ravindranath tagore and mahatma gandhi was regarded as the 100 most influential people in the 20th century and one of the 20 most influential people from asia in the 20th century in the 21st century he gives a message to the world with regard to what we talk it talk about is global or gross domestic product the gdp which defines the success of economies of various nations but if you look at role of india 500 years from today or before today india was contributing to 20% of the gdp a global gdp 500 years before today but in the year 2000 when that assessment was taken it was revealed that the united states of america has been now contributing to more than 20% to global gdp and how this transformation has taken place the economies that have grown by exploitation of natural resources and by exploitation of knowledge base from the developing world and the developed nation has always they have always been in the forefront of commanding position in the form of increase or contribution to global gdp but what is equally and more important probably as is now been proved that the gross national happiness the versus between the gdp and the gross national happiness has been very aptly reiterated by the father of green revolution dr m s swaminathan who once when interviewed by the star tv as early as in 2011 he compared the gdp with the gross national happiness and he said and i quote even if we can't quantify happiness as precisely as we currently quantify gdp perhaps it is better to be vaguely right than precisely wrong and this is the concluding statement that i would like to use for concluding my presentation and also look forward for a global cooperation and a sustained collaboration within the universities in india and abroad where we can work as a global community for overcoming the problems of not only pandemics like covid 19 but also the challenges that are posed by environmental concerns for achieving the millennium development goals and therefore if you want to achieve ecological security economic efficiency and social equity you will have to toy with the formula of education equal to future which is the smallest formula or smaller than the e is equal to mc square formula and dr mashelkar has reiterated with the help of this formula that education is future and that is where i would like to conclude my presentation i would like to thank the organizers particularly my friend and one of the visionary chancellors that i have seen in our country as well as anywhere in the world dr mahbubul haq who with his 
impeccable impeccable ability of bringing people together and working in the remote remotest regions of our country the northeast region and bringing in people together providing them vision as well as providing them a chance to stand on on their own feet develop fantastic characters by providing high class education i would like to thank the entire team of university of science and technology and also the participants the viewers of this particular event who have given me an inspiration to convey the points that i wanted to make by way of my presentation thank you once again thank you very much jai hind thank you so much sir actually sir we have got a host of questions from our participants uh, sir ek do question hum le sakte hain zarur please uh, sir uh, like do teen questions hi hum matlab uh, we have tried to scrutinize uh, ek to sir first we would like to ask you sir do you feel that our university laboratories and computer infrastructure is adequate to yes. meet the changes that you are advocating sir yes yeah basically what has happened now is that the infrastructure that we have developed over the last several decades you take example of universities abroad for example in united states of america people are looking at the infrastructure and going there for face to face education but the situation today that we are all in like covid 19 and the post covid 19 scenario the advent of the technologies as well as the industrial revolutions that are happening at the very speed the speedy pace that is every 10th year we are having next revolution coming in and therefore in the advent of these developments we will not be only depending on the infrastructure yes we require an infrastructure for providing quality education but we will also have to depend on collaborations where such infrastructure is there we need not repeat that infrastructure in our own institution and expose our students by way of outsourcing them to these excellent institutions where education is available in different faculty which we are not providing in our own institutions and by way of that i have meant that the infrastructure is not the only criteria which will be a deciding factor uh, factor in future education sir uh, another question actually sir uh, put by a participant sir in the post pandemic situation a different skill sets will require like the skill set will change so your take on it well the skill sets and our honorable prime minister had mentioned that you have to make in india you have to have digital universities and if you are talking about make in india skill india then we will have to ensure that our youth is exposed to the skill sets that are already available in our own country i remember during our days when we had completed our ssc examination some of my friends wanted to opt for an admission in industrial training institutes what we call it as itis and they were the institution which were offering skill based training they were all merit holders they were all 80% 85% merit holders in ssc exams or even in 12th exam but instead of going for a conventional engineering program they opted for itis and some of them by acquiring skills in itis got immediate jobs in industries because they wanted to go for jobs because of their economic situation and today I remember after getting into the jobs after few years their own companies they actually gave them an opportunity to go for higher education and enhance quality of their education so they went for formal engineering because those days part time engineering courses were also available in various engineering colleges so by acquiring skill sets within 2 years they got for a they got a job and few years later they went for enhancement of their academic qualification which gave them an opportunity to go at a higher level higher up in the ladder at professional level so what i'm trying to say here now is those itis i'm sure in each district there is at least one iti developed by state government but they have become redundant to the current aspirants of higher education why can't we affiliate itis to the universities and if the degree programs do not offered by itis if you have certificate programs if you have diplomas if they are validated by the universities and itis are affiliated to the universities i am sure many students who do not get an opportunity for 
going for higher education will opt for these skill based programs and that is why the skill india the dream of our honorable prime minister can become reality in shorter period of time uh, so sir you you uh, like you know you are saying that there is like you know academia has a very specific role to play uh, in the post covid socio economic revival of the development developing countries sir well i would not call a very limited uh, role i would say the role of academic institution is going to be multifaceted and also enhanced in multiples we have a greater responsibility now because we all know that education is going to be the only way by which we can sustain the problems of population with respect to the environmental calamities or economic situations of the world and that is where i feel that the universities will have to diversify in their approach of dissemination of knowledge so it is not restricting the roles of universities but providing them an impetus by way of encouragement from mhrd government of india and enhancing their capabilities enhancing their role widening their role for reaching larger segment of population which is in need of higher education uh, sir one last question because of the time constraint actually yes. your uh, like if you would like to ask uh, your opinion on this they are like one of the participant has asked action research is needed for sustaining ecosystem so your take on it right yes action research is required but i would say anticipatory research is more important if you visualize an impact of a calamity that is foreseen but it can be a for unforeseen situation if you are able to visualize that impact of a calamity which may not happen today like global warming we were talking about global warming not before 1985 or 86 when only at global level in 1987 we had intergovernmental panel on climate change that was established but for the first one decade after it took over various research activities nobody was believing that global warming is actually going to take place but ultimately the ipcc which was chaired by one of our visionary scientists dr uh, pachori the ipcc was given the nobel prize of peace so what i'm trying to say is that action action research is very very important but that will have to be undertaken by looking at the problems that the world is going to face in future so anticipatory research based action research is the need of the hour uh thank you so much sir i think uh, like i would now like to request uh, dr rashmi sankakoti uh, to kindly our uh, faculty from usstm uh, to kindly present the vote of thanks rashmi yes a very good afternoon to respected professor sanjay deshmukh sir former vice uh, chancellor university of mumbai and professor of life sciences mr mohabbul haq sir honorable chancellor university of science and technology meghalaya dr middel hajorika sir vice chancellor usstm Prof. Sir Sohail Sabisa, Prof. Vice Chancellor USTM, panelist, participants of today's webinar, ladies and gentlemen. In the beginning, I would like to express my profound gratitude to our resource person of today's webinar lecture, Prof. Sir Sanjay Deshmukh Sir, for sharing his knowledge regarding today's topic. As we know that research and development has been proved to be a crucial factor in moving the world technological frontiers. while at the same time facilitating new technical and scientific innovations sir has explained very well how important it is to have quality of university research innovative use of technology linking science with society etc that can play very important role in the society he has also explained the role of university head the role of educationist regarding creation preservation and dissemination of knowledge in this covid-19 crisis time i must mention our deep sense of appreciation for your very interesting and thought provoking lecture thank you sir thank you. Thank i would you. also like to convey my heartfelt thanks to our honorable chancellor mr mohabbul haq sir without whose support we would not have been able to organize this series of webinar sir keeps telling us how universities are an increasing important component of the society for scientific innovation and technological advances of a country moreover he is always motivating us in these days to believe that the proliferation of internet based education has opened access to education to a wider population through real time online classes series of webinar etc thank you sir for your continuous guidance to conduct 
this webinar for the benefits of participants at this crisis time of global pandemic. We are extremely grateful to Dr. Middal Hajorika Sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor USTM, and Professor Sohil Savisa, Pro Vice Chancellor USTM, for giving us moral support and continuous guidance to conduct this series of webinars. I would like to thank Register, Academic Register, Deputy Register, Director, Student Affair, OSD USTM, and to all the faculty members of USTM present here for their support and participation. I'm extremely grateful to all the panelists present here for smooth functioning of the webinar. Last but not the least, I'm very grateful to all the panelists for attending this webinar. I'm very sure that all the panelists have learned many new things regarding today's topic, role of universities in research, development, and innovation. It is true that if in the last two decades, there is a fundamental transformation of the universities as wonderful teaching institutions into a combination of teaching with research. I would be failing in my duty if I don't convey my thanks to all the administrative and technical staff for smooth functioning of this webinar. My sincere apology to anyone whom I might have missed to thank. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you thank very you. much for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Rashmi Rekha. Uh, uh, sir, we are really honored. Aap hamesha hamare guide rahe hai, hamare mentor rahe hai, and you are also one of the person who has pushed us uh, to do better, to perform better. Or hum chahte hai, hum jante hai, nahi chahte nahi, hum jante hai. Aap hamesha hamare saath rahoge. Aap guiding us, mentoring us, sir. I am honored also for this great association. I look forward to working with you and assisting all of you to reach your desired goals. Congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, dear participants, uh, we will meet you in the next uh, installment of the USTM lecture series. Uh, the fifth lecture, which will be organized on the 23rd of June at 11 a.m. We'll have another eminent academician, Professor Jaya Shankar, sir. He'll be joining us at 11 a.m. Uh, we will be uh, joining, seeing you then and request all to kindly fill the feedback form by tonight uh, midnight tonight. Thank you, sir, and good day Thank to you, all. Sir. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.